Okay, so uh, let us continue. Uh, we already saw one version of the spectral theorem where the algebra, the commutative C star subalgebra with identity of B of H. So these these elements were already operators. It can be written as uh, integral of the Galfand transform of these operators against a unique regular projection valued measure. Okay. In the second version of the spectral theorem, we will see that it can be realized in a slightly more concrete way by paying a price of certain kind of non-uniqueness by realizing these operators as multiplication operators on some L2 spaces. Okay. So, L2, so it, it has to be L2 space with respect to some measure and there is some non-uniqueness in those, uh, those measures. Okay, but the, it's not. Uh, we will make all these things uh, precise as we go along. Right now, we'll just realize them as multiplication operators. Okay, so let us start with uh, uh, writing down that theorem. Okay, so spectral theorem two. Uh, let's say spectral theorem two. So second version. So the first one was uh, writing using in terms of uh, projection valued measures. So here. I have A contained in B of H, uh, commutative sister algebra algebra, right. So, all the usual adjectives are there, it is commutative sister algebra with identity, with identity, okay. Then there exists a semi finite, so we define semi finiteness, right, semi finite measure space measure space that means if i have a if i have a set with finite uh, infinite measure there is a subset with positive finite measure right that is what semi finiteness means semi finite measure space so let's say omega script f and uh, mu comma a unitary map so we are going to realize the script a which is the commutative sister algebra sub, sub algebra of operators as multiplication operators on L2 of mu, right. So, there is a unitary map which will take A to multiplication operators, so, okay. So, and and uh, and and isometric isometric star isomorphism. Well, it is not isomorphism because it is not on 2. So, because we are going inside bounded operators on L2, we will not get all of them, only some of them. So, isometric star homomorphism, okay, uh, which is we denote it by T going to phi sub T from A into L infinity of mu. Okay. So, the T, the operators T come from script A and any t is identified with a bounded function phi sub t right in l infinity mu that means it's bounded bounded function phi sub t and the operator uh, becomes multiplication by phi sub t so that is the identification okay such that so this identification is such that u t u inverse acting on psi equal to i'll write down this and then explain phi sub t psi for every psi in L2 of mu, right? For every psi in L2 of mu, okay. So I have the uh, Hilbert space H, okay. I have this unitary operator U which goes to L2 of mu, and the T of course takes H to H. Here I have another U, and this is going to L2 of mu and here I have multiplication by phi sub t. Okay. Right, that is what this, uh, this means. So, the operator t after conjugating by the unitary operator u becomes multiplication by uh, phi sub t. Okay. So, for each t there is a phi sub t which is in L infinity and t can be t is unitarily equivalent to uh, m. Uh, m phi t that means multiplication by phi t. The same unitary works for everything in A. Okay. 
Now, more information on omega and mu the space the space omega where this uh, the semi finite measure is realized can be taken to be. So, the space omega can be taken to be the uh, disjoint union of disjoint union of the spectrum itself of of copies of copies of the spectrum sigma of the spectrum sigma of a okay in such a way that in such a way that so the space omega now is a disjoint union of copies of uh, sigma. So, you think of it as sigma union sigma union sigma union etcetera, but these sigmas are viewed as uh, disjoint copies and the measure mu is such that restricted to each of these copies the mu is going to be finite in such a way that mu is finite mu is finite in each copy. In fact, you can make this into a probability measure if it is a finite measure you can divide by an appropriate constant and make it into a, a probability measure and phi sub t. So, phi sub t is the L infinity function which corresponds to the operator t right. So, t going to phi sub t is the star uh, star algebra map right which is isometric. So, phi sub t uh, restricted to each copy can be identified with the Gelfand transform of t. So, phi t equal to t hat on each copy right everything makes sense right because each copy is the spectrum of A and on the spectrum of A uh, t hat that is the Gelfand transform is a continuous function. So, it is a bounded function there right. So, phi sub t can be uh, thought of as t hat multiplication by t hat on each of these copies right. So, that is the uh, full theorem. So, let us read it again any commutative sister algebra with identity uh, consisting of operators we have a semi finite measure space unitary map u and this homomorphism t going to phi sub t which allows us to realize any t as multiplication by phi t on the semi finite uh, measure space. Okay, so, we will prove this. Okay, so, this is the second version of the uh, spectral theorem. As I said, we will see more and more such uh, things, we will we'll restrict ourselves to the case of a single operator and so on, and in, in some cases, we will go to self adjoint ones and so on. Okay. So, first suppose there exist V in H. So, <coughs> well, this is a standard way of doing things. Uh, first, we look at the cyclic case, that means there exists some vector V such that uh, you look at A V right. So, we have seen this uh, earlier I believe A is the sister algebra of operators. So, you apply it on V right. So, this is a collection of operators acting on V. So, that is T V where T belongs to A ok. So, this is a subspace right because if I take two such vectors then it will look like T V and S V if I add them I will get T plus S V right. So, this is a subspace and if this is dense in H. So, first we are supposing that there exists a V such that A V is dense in H ok. So, this is called the cyclic case ok. The V is called the cyclic vector. So, if I look at A V and look at the closure of that that is going to be H. So, let mu be equal to mu v v. So, remember these uh, measures we define mu v v uh, from continuous functional calculus right. So, we may also assume that because v I can multiply by any constant I want right non zero constant I will still get a cyclic vector. So, we may assume that we may assume that the norm v equal to 1. Okay, so, that mu is a probability measure ok. So, it is a finite probability it is a finite. So, in fact, it is a probability measure ok. Well, where on 
remember this is going to be on sigma right ok. For T in script A, so you take one operator we have norm of T v square ok, well this is nothing but inner product of T star T v v. Now, once you have that v v you know the measure mu v v will come in right. So, this is simply integral uh, over sigma the Galvan transform of t star t that is mod t hat square right d mu right because mu is mu v v right. So, it is just mod t square mod, mod t hat square d mu. Hence, well you see a isometric map already right because this norm is same as this norm. So, that actually tells me that there is a isometric map. So, hence if T v equal to S v where T and S are actually in the algebra A then 0 equal to T v minus S v norm square where equal to. So, let me write one more step trivial step square and use the above identity I will have T hat minus S hat norm square d right. So, if if T v equal to S v then we have this to be equal to 0 implies T hat equal to S hat uh, mu almost everywhere right. So, as L 2 functions both T hat and S hat are same right hence T hat and S hat can be identified. can be identified as L 2 mu elements right. So, on L 2 mu these two functions are same. So, it follows that <coughs> it follows that T v going to T hat right. So, where is T v? T v is in the Hilbert space H. So, this is in the Hilbert space H, this is an L2 of mu, right. So, it is a map from, so it is a map from, map from H or some subspace of H, right. So, it is actually from, uh, yeah, maybe I should clarify that because T V as T runs over A. So, it is a map from A V, which is a dense subspace into L2 of mu, right. So, that is how it is defined is an isometry right is a well defined is a well defined isometry right that is what we just proved ok. And since it is a well defined isometry on a dense subspace right. So, since V is cyclic so that means, A V is dense is dense in H this map T v going to T head extends to an isometry on uh, H right. So, uh, this isometry, so this isometry extends to extends to an isometry uniquely on all of H right because a v is dense in H and from A v to uh, L 2 of mu we have a isometry. So, uh, let us let us give it a name this isometry extends to an isometry let us say u ok. So, now u is a map from H to L 2 mu ok. I do not know what is the range. Well, where does uh, things in A go? If I look at uh, A v, A v is going to anything in A v is like T v, T v goes to T hat right. So, all the T hats, so let us see. So, range of, so note that maybe it is better to write down instead of saying that note that, note that if I look at all these T hats where T in A, well that is the image of T v right under u. Right. So, this is contained in range of u, range of u. 
ok. But this is equal to equal to continuous functions on sigma right and that is what is sitting inside L 2 of mu and remember mu is regular ok. So, C sigma is dense right continuous functions on uh, sigma will be dense in L 2 of mu right if mu is regular and it is a finite uh, measure as well. So, range of u because u is an isometry it is close right since u is an isometry isometry range u is is closed ok and it has a dense subspace inside it consequently consequently range u will have to be equal to all of L 2 mu right because you have all continuous functions in the range and so it has to be. So, hence u is unitary and u is unitary ok. So, just to repeat we mapped a v right. So, ok let us write this once more if I take t in a then t v is mapped to uh, the gulf on transform right. So, that extended to the map u from h to L 2 of mu right that is what we have done ok. Now, what we do is we transform this operator t to the other side on L 2 using this unitary operator u and see what happens ok. So, it uh, ok. So, maybe a, a picture will be fine. So, if if psi is a um, let us take continuous function. So, psi in C sigma ok which is contained in L 2 of mu ok. So, remember the way these maps are going I have h, I have L 2 mu, I have the unitary u, I have the operators t from h to h, I have again u L 2 of mu ok. I want to know what is here ok. What is that map from L 2 mu to L 2 mu? So, that will identify T with some map from L 2 mu to L 2 mu right alright. So, if I take psi a continuous function on the sigma then it is an L 2 function right it is an L 2 mu ok. And if I take T in A that is the given C star sub algebra of operators then so, let us see what happens to the operator t after composing with u right. So, then u t u inverse of psi ok. So, u inverse goes from L 2 mu to h right. So, it is going in this direction right that is u inverse. So, I am taking a psi in L 2 mu and then applying u inverse. So, I will go to the corresponding Hilbert space h and then I apply t. So, what is going to happen? This is equal to u t. What is u inverse of psi? Psi is a continuous function right. So, psi is identified with an operator in A. That operator acting on V is what goes to psi under the unitary u right. T v is, is going to t hat. So, if I take some function on the right hand side I look at the operator whose Gelfand transform is that and apply that operator on v that is how u inverse works. So, the Gelfand trans inverse Gelfand transform of psi is T psi that is my operator right and I look at it on operate, operate it on v. This is how u inverse psi is right. So, u t u inverse psi will be u t T psi acting on psi on v equal to T T psi well ok. So, maybe uh, let me write down u t t psi v once more v. t t psi where is t psi that is in a t is in a. So, t t psi is in a I have u acting on something on uh, a acting on v what is that the image will be simply the Gelfand transform of whatever that operator is. So, that is T T psi and its Gelfand transform equal to 
Well, if I multiply two operators and take the Gelfand transform, that will be the product of the Gelfand transform on the other side. So, that is T hat into the Gelfand transform of T psi. What is that? That is psi, right? Because inverse Gelfand transform of psi is what we denote by T sub psi, right? So, you simply look at uh, the Gelfand transform of T times T psi, you will get T hat into psi. Now, so let us look at this very carefully. The operator u t u inverse acting on the function psi is multiplication by t hat on the function psi, right. So, on the right hand side I will have m t hat. Why? Because psi is coming from the continuous functions and that is dense in L2, right. So, on a dense on a dense subspace on a dense subspace of L2 of mu, what is the dense subspace? C sigma, we have we have u t u inverse equal to multiplication by t hat. Okay. So, multiplication by t hat is a bounded function bounded operator on L2 of mu. Why? Because t hat is a bounded function, it is a continuous function on a compact space, so it is bounded. So, multiplication by m t hat uh, by t hat is a bounded operator and we are saying two bounded operators agree on a dense subspace which is C sigma. So, they have to agree everywhere, right. So, this implies u t inverse uh, equal to m t hat on L 2 of mu. Okay. So, after conjugating an operator in A by u, we get multiplication by t hat on y. Right. So, this is the cyclic case. Okay. So, we are done in the we are done in the cyclic case. Okay, so, there, there is no uh, copies of sigma coming just one copy of sigma and on sigma we have this measure mu uh, which is given by the cyclic vector v and mu you can take it to be a probability measure and any t becomes multiplication by t hat right that is my phi sub t in the theorem uh, on L 2 of mu right. So, cyclic case is easy. Now, to prove it in general, uh, we so here itself you can see the non uniqueness part because the cyclic vector need not be unique, right. What if I take another cyclic vector? So, instead of v, I take some w which is a cyclic vector, then identification. So, the map which we did, which was uh, Tv going to T hat, will be Tw going to T hat, and that might give us a new measure mu. Right, it does not have to. So, mu w w need not be equal to mu v v. So, it might give us a different measure, and these measures are related in some way. Okay, we will come to that later. Thing is, already you can see that the mu need not be regular, uh, unique. Okay, so, we are done in the cyclic case. For the general case, uh, for the general case. Let so we in the general case we simply repeat this, right? So you take one vector v, let us say, and apply a to it. So you will get a v, right? So all t v where t belongs to the algebra a, and then take the closure of that. So that gives me a subspace of the Hilbert space, but then that subspace is a cyclic subspace, right? And we can apply everything to that particular. Uh, uh, subspace if I know that the operators sort of act on that right. So, that is easy to see and then we continue using Zorn's lemma right. So, that is the standard uh, standard application of Zorn's lemma, but let us understand this. So, for the general case let v i i in i some indexing set capital I be a maximal Uh, collection of collection of non zero non zero uh, orthogonal vectors orthogonal vectors uh, such that h i equal to uh, a v i bar okay, are orthogonal. 
okay, yeah, I do not need orthogonality here because it is automatically implied. So, uh, be a collection of maximal non-zero vectors such that these spaces. So, you take one vector v, you look you apply a to it the algebra to it. So, you get a subspace take the closure and then take some other vector from the orthogonal complement of that apply a to it take the closure and then go on right. So, the maximal collection comes from the zones lemma argument. So, you take a maximal collection of non-zero vectors v i such that each h i a v i bar are orthogonal right. So, you can choose these v i's with appropriate norms if you want if i is countable you can choose v i. So, that certain things uh, certain sum becomes finite. So, that the measure you get will be finite, but that is something we will see later ok. <coughs> so, note that note that each h i is invariant under a right because it is a v i bar right. So, if I apply a I am still going to be in h i, but you see a is closed under the star operation. So, its complement is also going to be invariant under h i. So, uh, invariant under a. So, note that so or since since a is closed under closed under star operation uh, h i complement the orthogonal complement of h is also invariant under a. Under a. Okay. That means, these are reducing subspaces for a which means that both t and t star right both uh, t and t star will leave h i invariant where t is in a. So, it, it sort of decomposes uh, the action of a on the Hilbert space decomposes into action of a on each of this h i and so we can look at this each of h i uh, separately ok. Also invariant under a and each h i is cyclic. Right, with cyclic vector with cyclic vector v i right. So, that much is trivial. So, one can look at simply h i and look at uh, pre use the previous result right the cyclic uh, vector result we will get a measure mu restricted to. So, measure is supported on sigma right. Now, for each i we have this copy of sigma and we add up. Also note that also note that h will have to be equal to direct sum of h i ok. If not there is something in the orthogonal complement right. So, that is easy if not there exists some v in the orthogonal complement of h i and uh, it will contradict the maximality of the vectors v i right and it will contradict the maximality of the collection right because a the orthogonal complement of the direct sum of h i right the space is also invariant under a right because each h i is invariant under a direct sum of h i is invariant under a the orthogonal complement is invariant under a if there is something there I can take a v and form a cyclic subspace right. But then that v can be added to the collection of v i, but v i is supposed to be maximal with that property right that is the maximal thing exists via Zorn's lemma ok. So, that I will leave it to you. So, all that I have done is writing down the Hilbert space h as a direct sum of cyclic subspaces ok and there is no uniqueness there again. I can start with any vector and then apply a to it and I will get a cyclic subspace then look at the orthogonal complement. So, depending on which vector I take the cyclic subspace decomposition can be quite different ok. So, now we are in a position to complete the proof. <coughs> so, <coughs> for each i we can apply the previous result right. So, let sigma i be a copy of be a copy of sigma and write omega to be 
union sigma i disjoint union okay so you can think of uh, you know something like this each of them is a copy of sigma right so depending on your uh, imagination you think of this as a infinite union of so it doesn't have to be countable okay so depending on what the indexing set i is you may have an uncountable union or a countable union if h is separable then of course i has to be countable we'll we'll come to, come come to that later okay let mu i equal to mu vi vi as earlier right so if i had a if i had one vector v which gave me a cyclic subspace which was dense in the whole hilbert space we constructed that mu right which is mu v v now for each of this copy of uh, sigma we have these measures right which i and i mu v i v i and that will work for the subspace h i right okay and we put together and define so define okay so i should tell you the sigma algebra first okay uh, let okay so let script f be the sigma algebra of subsets of omega so omega remember is is uh, copies of uh, sigma and i'm going to define a sigma algebra on this union right so sigma algebra of subsets of uh, omega defined by so let us put in e e of omega um, such that e intersected with sigma i um, so sigma i is the ith copy of sigma right e intersected with sigma i should be borel is borel in sigma i sigma i is sigma okay so i have this disjoint copies of sigma i and i have a set which is in a subset of this union of disjoint copies such that if i restrict that means intersect with each of the sigma i's i get a borel subset there and i put together such set so that is going to be a sigma algebra okay so that's a trivial thing to check so i have a sigma algebra on the union of sigma i's and define define the measure mu on script f by mu of e equal to well i i restrict it to each sigma i right so uh, this is going to be the sum of i mu of e intersection sigma i right and you can easily prove that it is a countably additive uh, measure since each sorry mu i okay so since each mu i is finite right mu i is the one which is supported on sigma i right we see that it is semi finite right so mu mu i is finite we get that mu is semi finite okay mu is semi finite because on each sigma i it is finite right and then you can form l2 mu so l2 mu will be direct sum i l2 of mu i right i in i it may be countable or uncountable sum and then you can define ui define ui from uh, hi to l2 of mu i right that is at the each cyclic subspace level you can define this ui unitary and u from l2 of mu to sorry h i uh, h to l2 of mu by u equal to direct sum u i right it is the same operator u i on, on each level then you can check so everything else now is set because at each level at each ith level you know that the operator t goes to multiplication by t head on the other side right so then so i'll stop with this then if t is in a then u t u inverse is 
multiplication by phi sub t what is phi sub t so u is the direct sum of u i right u t u inverse is going to be u i t u inverse in each of these pieces and each of these pieces has multiplication by t hat right. So, is multiplication by phi hat phi t where phi sub t equal to t hat on each sigma i on each sigma right and everything else is trivial because Gelfand transform is a isometric isomorphism and all that right. So, since Gelfand, so I will stop with uh, this line. So, Gelfand transform is a star homomorphism because it is t going to t hat essentially in each copies. The map is also a star homomorphism and norm t equal to norm of u t u inverse which is equal to the L infinity norm because it is a semi finite measure space we are done. So, it is it becomes isometry and it is a star homomorphism right. <coughs> okay, so, we will stop here. <coughs> so, we have proved the second version of the spectral theorem <coughs> which says that if you have a commutative uh, C star subalgebra with identity of bounded operators on a Hilbert space, it can be uh, identified as uh, as the space of or, or as a collection of operators which are given by multiplication by uh, bounded function right on a semi finite uh, measure space and much more information is available that the semi finite uh, measure is actually uh, finite on each copy of the spectrum. So, the space is going to be uh, disjoint union of copies of the spectrum and on each restricted to each spectrum the measure is going to be finite that is why it is semi finite and the multiplication if I take t the corresponding function which which uh, which gives me the multiplication operator on the other side is actually the Gelfand, trans, uh, Gelfand transform restricted to each of these sigma i's right. So, that is a concrete version and as I said there is no uniqueness here because depending on how you choose the cyclic vectors you may have different measures coming, okay. but they are all related in some way or the other we will see that at a later class. We will stop here.